Welcome to Capital Link's Trending News podcast series. In this podcast series, we have the opportunity to discuss with company management on recent news and, an, uh, and announcements they have made. I am Nicholas Bornois, President of Capital Link, and we have with us today Mr. Robert Bugby, President and Director of Scorpio Tankers. Our discussion will touch upon the company's Q1 2023 recently announced results, but will mainly focus on Scorpio Tankers' development, strategy, and sector outlook. A quick reminder of our disclaimer that podcasts are provided purely for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind, and Capital Link bears no responsibility for their content. Scorpio Tankers is a provider of marine transportation of petroleum products worldwide. The company currently owns, lease finances, or bare boat charters in 113 product tankers with an average age of 7.3 years. Scorpio Tankers is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol STNG. Robert, welcome to our podcast. You just announced the results of a phenomenal Q1 2023 net income of 193.3 million and adjusted EBITDA of 286.4 million. This contrasts with a loss of 84.4 million and adjusted EBITDA of 79.4 million for Q1 2022. So this is quite a difference. Obviously, market conditions played a major role in this performance. So let's start the discussion with a question on the product tanker market. Please share with us the major market dynamics during Q1 and where is the market today? Thanks very much, Nicholas, and thank you for letting us discuss today. Um, okay, so I think that you know quarter one was clearly a carry on from um, last year with very, very strong rates, very strong performance. There was a little bit of volatility to the downside in the early part of the quarter as we were waiting to see the effect of the um, Russian sanctions. But then the quarter got back into line and moved forward. And you can see as we get into the present from our earnings guidance for or our bookings guidance for the second quarter, you know, the second quarter even started off a little stronger than the first quarter. And we would right this second, we're probably spending a, a few days, maybe 10, 15 days of um, weaker markets um, because of, of the um, because of just like a turnaround during the spring. We got uh, oil price falling, so traders don't like to catch the falling uh, knife, and we're right in between. You know the heating seasons and the driving seasons in the northern hemisphere. More importantly, we're seeing very strong dynamics in the supply and demand of products. We're seeing jet fuel opening up. I mean, every day we all of us now are reading the newspapers, the the um, big bookings for the aircraft industry, the bookings for the cruise industry, and we see that um, expectations of people's travel on the roads are going to be increasing very soon. So we're very optimistic uh, going forward as uh, spring starts to develop. And um, you know, we were already off a very, despite the slight weakness in the last week or so, those rates are still at very, very high levels as a good base. So now, uh, thank you for this uh, market update. Uh, let's now focus on your strategy and discuss together key issues related to fleet development, the leveraging, capital allocation, and the chartering strategy. Let's start with the fleet development and uh, the related financings. Currently, you have 113 ships on the water. It is very interesting that uh, while in the past we have used leasing extensively, now you're buying back the vessels. To be precise, uh, as we announced, since August of uh, 2022, you have given notice to repurchase 41 vessels under lead financing and one under a credit facility. From those, uh, you have repaid the outstanding debt on 28 um, so far, and the remaining 14 will be done within Q3 and Q2 of this year. So what drives the strategy 
of moving away from the lease financing and owning the vessels? And what do you expect to get from this? Well, I think there are two, two reasons. First of all, the total amount of debt we have is falling very rapidly. So by definition, when so much of our debt previously was um, lease finance, and that lease finance was put on when liquidity was an issue in weak markets, um, you know, to the extent that we're driving the debt down in the company, that's the natural place where, where you would, you know, debt would come down is the leases. The second benefit of taking the, the derivative of that is that the lease financings now that the balance sheets have improved, we can accelerate the repurchase of those lease financings and are, are really incentivized to do so because the new finance that we're putting in is substantially less expensive and more flexible than the lease finances that the vessel's on now. So what we're going to end up having is, is a total um, lower debt, lower margins, and more flexibility. So I, I assume, Robert, that uh, based on what you said, you are arranging new financing, but at the same time, you're using a lot of your cash flow uh, to repay the, uh, the lease. Yes, yes. So we'll talk about the capital allocation later on, but I think that's a good point to make that you're using part of your internal cash flow to uh, repay these financings. Now, are there, as you mentioned, there are 42 vessels that you have announced so far. Are there more to come? Uh, we would hope so. Yes, as we, as we, you know, we're very optimistic of the market itself. So we would expect to have the, the cash flow anyway to, to take it down. But more importantly than that, um, you know, we've just announced a, that we're negotiating and discussing a, a rather a large um, commercial debt finance, which will really accelerate the ability to to take down those leases. Robert, this takes me to the next question. Uh, you announced uh, a major financing package of a billion plus. Uh, so two questions for you here. Where do you plan to use this financing? What for? And number two, do you see any change in the landscape of uh, finance? Who are the major providers now? Do you see any new players? Do you see any change in, uh, in, in the landscape? Well, these this finances are let's say you know what you'd expect they were they're the, they're the commercial lenders they're returning in force i think to you know to the, those companies that are showing the cash flows and you know sting is much more attractive with a lower leverage and new fleet and a market that is is throwing off strong cash uh, what are we going to use it for we're going to use it predominantly to um to to buy back the, you know, the leased vessels, to accelerate that buying back the leased vessels. It has a, um, a, a facility for it too, that, you know, creates more um, flexibility. So the first stage would be to buy back the vessels. The second stage would be to, you know, probably have some undrawn credit lines too. I see. Robert, as you mentioned, lease financing overall has played a major role, I think, in the overall landscape of ship finance. Do you now the majority of your credit facility is based on commercial bank lending? Do you see uh, an increased activity uh, from uh, commercial banks in terms of ship finance? Uh, I see that where you have much lower leverage, overall leverage in the companies. Um, you know, I, th I think that you are going to have an increase of, of commercial bank finance. Very interesting. So that takes me to the next question. As you mentioned in your earnings presentation from December 31, 2021, end of uh, 2021, to the end of June of 2023, within a year and a half, you expect to have reduced indebtedness by a billion four of which a billion one relates to the lease financing. So do you plan to continue with the debt reduction? And is there an optimal debt level at which you feel comfortable with? For the time being, we're going to continue with the debt reduction. Um, we're you know, not going to go to zero. We've said that. 
Um, we have a, you know, we have a range that we think is optimal, but we're not yet ready to, you know, discuss that openly. We're just going to do the job first, which is to take the debt down to where that range is. So let's go now to uh, fleet development. You have 113 eco fuel efficient vessels on the water, average age of 7.3 years. I think it's quite lower compared to the uh, industry average. And you have no new building orders. Are there any plans for any further fleet expansion, fleet renewal, fleet redeployment? No. The, not at all, not on the acquisition side or the new building side. You know, you may see us sell, you know, two, three, whatever, a handful potentially of our older assets, especially as our shares are trading so much below net asset value. The money would be much better deployed in, um, you know, acquiring stock, for example. So now let's go to uh, chartering. Uh spot versus uh, charter cover what is the current situation of the fleet and uh, are you at the point of uh, possibly considering to increase your uh, long-term charter exposure no we, the, the long-term charter exposure is is not market related i mean we're very confident to the market going forward and you know you have to give a steep discount really to to the spot market in order to do term charters it's more lined up to the um, the risk in the company. So as we take down the leverage and we increase the, the, the cash and the liquidity, we are less motivated to put vessels out on, on time charter, actually. Very interesting. And of course, I think that when the market is so robust, you take advantage of the market. And the market is very robust. I mean, I think it's important to understand that we we bought a lot of stock back in the first quarter. We paid off debt, and you know, we we end the and we just announced that we have, you know, eight hundred million dollars of liquidity on the balance sheet, uh, even after all of that. So, you know, that there's, you know, continuing to pay off debt, you know, ahead of our schedule is let's say a, a conservative move in itself. So that's sort of balanced by the ability then to keep your vessel spot. But also on, on the fleet um, strategy, a deployment strategy and, and the market conditions, you're a big proponent of, uh, of pools. You participate in a number of uh, important pools and by definition, yes. these are spot driven. Okay, so, you know, we're great proponent of pools because it allows you to um, to optimize the the actual flexibility of your fleet and provide a better service to your customer you're able to um, provide multi-form contracts um, if a vessel is running late you're able to substitute those vessels and you, uh, you you create a more sort of adult relationship with the customer because you you're touch points with the customer are daily uh, in multiple frequency. So you end up actually, you know, improving your situation through many different ways, including information as well. Very interesting. And I think in many cases, not only you take advantage of the spot market, but in certain cases, you outperform the market as well because of the pool efficiencies. So let me now come to, uh, very interesting topic. I mean, all of the topics that we discuss are very interesting, but this is capital allocation. You have strong cash flow. You're using it for debt reduction, share buybacks, and dividends. We talked about uh, debt reduction. Actually, there are no new building commitments, minimal capital expenditures. So net, let's turn now to share buybacks. Since July of uh, 2022, you have repurchased common shares for about 350 million. And you have recently reset your share buyback program. So what drives this strategy of buying back shares? And do you prefer share buybacks over dividends? Is there a point uh, that uh, it tips the balance between two, dividends versus buybacks? I think at the moment it's very easy. The, um, the fleet is a new fleet. 
the market is strong and we are trading at a very steep discount to the net asset value. So the best return on capital and the best value for our value creation for our shareholders is buying back stock. That's where it is. If the stock price was different, if the stock was trading above net asset value, you would not be looking to you know, be, be buying back stock at that point. So we're likely, I mean, as you have mentioned, uh, you're likely to continue on that path. Uh, to the extent that the, 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 the market allows us to. Correct. If the, if the gap closes, then you, know, you may see you know, a, a different form of returns. We're not, we've always been open to you know, playing special dividends. If there's the debt comes down and security comes down, we, we, you know, we may continue to raise the regular dividend. But right now, the discount is so steep, it would be irresponsible not to take advantage of that. I see. So now let, let's turn to dividends. Uh, you increase your quarterly dividend from uh, 20 cents per quarter to 25. That's a 20% increase. At current share price levels, this is about uh, an annualized yield of uh, 2%. And I think this is one of the lower, uh, at the lower end of the dividend yield of the majority of your peers. So given your strong cash flow generation, do you plan to increase your dividend? And, and how do you en enhance shareholder return was besides the debt reduction and the share buybacks? Well, you know, it's debt reduction improves the quality of the investment and the, the share buybacks are, you know, immediate return of capital, you know, immediate um, benefit to the shareholder. You're not having to wait to give the results of the second quarter and then you know give a dividend a bit later the second thing is that we're focused on regular dividends so the two percent yeah maybe low towards our competitors but it's in line or above the s p 500 and you know we've we've seen in the container industry we're seeing in the tanker industry that these you know high payout dividends related to income don't stop the stock price going down they they still come down and you know, we believe that this is not an industry that you should pay high payout dividends on. There has to be a better way. You know, we've gone from bankrupt, we've gone from normal cycle since the 1980s has been markets terrible. Companies have to do dilutive offerings to stay alive or sell assets. These are public companies. They then Market goes up, they buy assets, order assets, pay out huge dividends, cycle repeats. There has to be a different way to break the cycle. And perhaps by not paying out these dividends, perhaps the uh, public company could closer resemble a private company. I mean, the most successful shipping structures for all time, those that last the, take advantage of the down cycles rather than get killed in a, dry, in a down cycle, are those very successful you know, private ship owners? Robert, who, I don't, who, I, who I don't think are just dividending out everything they own from their family. Yeah. So. No, it, it is very interesting that uh, I think the tendency for public companies is for investors to look at uh, the dividend. But uh, you're very correct to point out that as a company, you follow a number of initiatives that all of them converge to uh, create shareholder value of the long term, debt reduction, the buybacks, the dividends. So it's not just one action. It's uh, a whole series of initiatives that, uh, you know. Yeah, that... Uh, and I'm sure this is supported by many of the long only big funds. I mean, we've had a, a huge long only big fund who's been involved in shipping for many years now say to us a year ago when are after when the containers started falling apart when are one of you guys just one going to act like a proper company that we see in other industries 
Interesting. So let me now turn to the uh, product market sector to, uh, to, because clearly market conditions play a very big role in the overall uh, performance. So please take us how, I mean, we already talked about that, but if we look forward now, take us how you see the demand supply balance evolving. Uh, there is also significant demand due to shifting trade routes, the China reopening, the post-COVID reopening, in increased mobility, as you mentioned. Uh, so despite this demand, the order book, the supply for tankers is very low and the global fleet is aging. So that's a good picture. How do you believe the market will develop going forward? I think it will continue to be a you know, strong market. We have you know, one of the most understated figures is the, is the overall inventories. I mean, every day the oil price seems to come down and every day the U.S. inventories come down. You know, at some point, things are going to, you know, to merge. And, you know, we, if we look around, talk to our friends, we, in the product tankers themselves, we can see the more planes in the air, more cars on the road. And we know from our experience in 2008, 2010, that the actual headline demand for refined petroleum products didn't actually change very much in that recession. But the demand side is pretty inelastic in a in a in a in just a recession at the moment, and we have such a lot of growth outside of um, the older economies going on in the product market too, that obviously has a much higher ton mile multiplier. And the most important thing is that, you know, the supply is really fixed for the next, you know, two, two and a half years time. And it's getting aging, it's aging for later. And it's going to take a huge amount of new building orders and multiple years to get that back into line. Very interesting. Now, let me ask you, one of the factors that have uh, contributed to the uh, current state of the product tanker market is uh, sanctions. Uh, do you see that uh, if the world, if the, the war is over, which we all hope at some point of time to be, do you see these changes in trade routes and so on to be permanent? Or do you see that uh, we may have a change in uh, the environment? I think before I answer that question, I'd like to point out that before the sanctions came into effect, the product market was doing great. So virtually all of 2022, which was a record year, was done without the sanctions. Now, I find it hard to believe that even God willing that the war came to an end tomorrow, that we would immediately go back to you know, everything's nice with Russia and world and the sanctions will be lifted immediately. Um, but there's going to be a little bit of time, even if that were to happen because of the way the fleet now is, you know, in the gray fleet, the new, the, um, you know, the, the approved fleet, as it were, the non-Russian trading fleet. And what will happen with those older vessels that are in that Russian trading, what will come out? So it's quite a difficult thing to predict, but it's not going to, um, you know, it's not, the market will not just fall apart to where it was in COVID times. That's, you know, not the comparison. The market was extremely strong last year without sanctions itself. But it's too hard to predict exactly what happens or what is going to happen to sanctions or production from Russia, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we do have, uh, uh, you know, we do have a, uh, one element that supposedly will stay there for, for, you know, for the long term. The dependence of the West on Russian energy sources is not going to go back to what it was pre-war. So if that change uh, in terms of the new energy landscape and new energy security stays there, we are going to see some permanent changes, I think. Yes, but we're going to see permanent changes, not just as a result of 
you know, the Russia, we're going to see it for the product market because, you know, the United States and the European refineries are getting older. That the, you know, the new refineries opening up are in China, India, um, the Middle East. So the, these are all that the major demand growth areas aren't for shipping, aren't, isn't the United States or Europe, it's South America, Africa, Asia. Or in Australia. Very interesting. So, Robert, coming to the close of our discussion, uh, let me ask you the way that you do, would describe the market, or that you pointed out strong demand, sustained demand, very low supply, a very robust market with, uh, um, with freight rates uh, you know, on the increase. Uh, actually, one of, you, of the analysts who um, wrote uh, a report after your earnings, uh, said that uh, the only thing to fear is fear itself. So uh, is there anything that you are concerned with, anything that could spoil that uh, picture? I mean, we have uh, a sky with no clouds. Is there any anything that you worry about? Um, I there's I, nothing. I mean, it, I would. Um, I'm very sure that there are many things that could take down the market that no one is thinking about at the moment. That is that is the way. You know, since the early part of my career, I've never seen anybody predict those things that actually hit a market very hard. You know, whether it's Saddam Hussein going into Kuwait, whether it's the Asian currency crisis, whether it was September the 11th, whether it was COVID. None of these things were ever, you know, talked about in boardrooms or with analysts or with investors. So I've kind of say to myself, look, I'm sure there are a bunch of things out there that I can't think of and no one else has thought of that could take the market down, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. I have to act on what I see in front of me and what I see in front of me is very, very constructive. Well, that's a very good closing line. Uh, Robert, thank you very, very much for being with us. Thank you for having this very insightful discussion, which uh, you know will be available as um, a replay upon demand. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. It's been great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you.